we're starting a new series this morning that's focused on the mission of the church, on our purpose as God's people in the world. The Apostle Paul is going to be our guide through this series. Paul is the author of several of the letters that make up a portion of the New Testament. And Paul also plays a big role in the book of Acts. And that book, the book of Acts, is where we're going to focus in this series. So just to orient you a little bit, the New Testament begins with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all, in slightly different ways, tell the story of Jesus, of his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. The book of Acts comes right after those Gospels. And it tells the story of the church, of the church's birth on the day of Pentecost, and of the Holy Spirit's continuing work through the church as it spreads from one little upper room out to all the ends of the earth. One of the ways that the Spirit grows the church in its early days is through Paul. In the book of Acts, Paul goes on three missionary journeys. He's sent by the Spirit to go from place to place, as he says it, to proclaim the good news. The good news about Jesus, which is that Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That Jesus came into the world not only to judge our sins, but to forgive our sins so that we can be made whole, so that we can have a flourishing relationship with God and with others, and thus, so that the world we live in today can become more like the world God intends for it to be. This morning, we're going to look at one part of Paul's first missionary journey. This journey takes him and his friend Barnabas through several different regions around the Mediterranean and through several different cities with hard-to-pronounce Bible names. And as they go from place to place to place, a theme emerges. They go into a city, proclaim the good news about Jesus, A great number of Jews and Greeks begin to believe. They begin to believe the good news about Jesus. And then some of the Jews stir up trouble until it eventually gets so bad that Paul and Barnabas have to leave and go on to the next place. We're going to see that theme happen in our story this morning. It's from Acts chapter 14, starting in verse 1. I invite you to read it along with me. The same thing, that's the theme, the pattern that's emerging, the same thing occurred in Iconium, where Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who testified to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to be done through them. But the residents of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, the apostles learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued proclaiming the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's funny to be thinking about missionary journeys, trips to faraway places during a global pandemic, because travel is different right now. I looked at some statistics this past week, and the number of people who pass through a TSA checkpoint at U.S. Uh, at US airports on a daily basis is one-fourth of what it was this time last year. Most people just aren't going anywhere right now. That's certainly true for our family. We we normally like to take a fun trip or two with the kids in the summer. Last year, we went to Chicago. The year before that, we went to Colorado. This year, well, this year we've been to the front yard several times. We've walked around the block a whole lot. We're at home a lot. Some weeks this summer, the furthest I went from home was to the grocery store. I know it's the same for many of you. And this is the great thing about the mission that God has given to the church. The mission that God has given to you as part of the church. You don't need to go anywhere to live it out. This is why our series for these three weeks is called Staycation. 
because we're going to be talking about our mission as the church, not just as an idea, not as a global concept somewhere out there, not as a thing we need to go away to do, but as a thing we live and breathe and do every day, right where we are, in our home, in our city, in our, in our neighborhood. It's not about going on a missionary journey. It's not about going on a mission trip. It's about living life on mission, right here in Bel Air, or in Meyerland, or in Maplewood, or in Linkwood, or in whatever neighborhood you're in. And our task is to do the same thing day in and day out, right here, right now, that Paul did when he went from place to place long ago. Our task is to proclaim the good news, the good news about Jesus, that Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That Jesus came into the world not only to judge our sins, but to forgive our sins so that we can be made whole, so that we can have a flourishing relationship with God and with others, and thus so that the world we live in today can become more like the world God intends for it to be. So how do we do that? How do we do that now, here. A couple of years ago, I had coffee at a place just down the street with a young woman who actually had been in the youth group of a church we used to serve. She was just out of college now and, and was pre- preparing to go out on a foreign mission to a former Soviet Republic. And we were talking about how you go about something like that and all the logistics involved and how you prepare. And what she told me is that she had three key, three key things that she was focusing on to prepare. The people, the place, and the purpose. The people, the place, the purpose. Those are going to be three keys for us too as we live life on mission here in Bel Air. They're all interconnected, of course, people, place, and purpose, but each each week we'll kind of focus on one of those. This week it's people. To live on mission, we have to pay attention to the people around us. We need to know who's near. Now, the scriptures don't tell us exactly how Paul went about this on his missionary journey, but they do reveal what he found. And what Paul found was diversity, difference among the people. The clearest way that it's presented in our story is in the distinction between Jews and Greeks. In Paul's world, there were significant cultural differences between those two groups, between Jews and Greeks. They ate different kinds of food. Their family lives were organized differently. They often worked in different sectors of the economy. They came from different ancestral heritages. Heritages. They had different interpretations of the past and different hopes for the future. There was all these differences between Jew and Greek. Now think about the people who live near you. If you're like me, you know some of the people who live in your neighborhood. And the people I've gotten to know in our neighborhood happen to be people who are a lot like me, a lot like us. They've got little kids, they spend time outside, we talk about sports, that sort of stuff. And one of the eye-opening things for me this quarantine season has been seeing how many different kinds of people live near us. Now, I knew that. Intellectually, I knew that. We live in Harris County, Texas. I know that it's a diverse place. But honestly, I just hadn't thought much about how it shows up in my neighborhood. For the past six months, though, we've been walking through the neighborhood each evening. I've been running through the neighborhood each day, and I've begun to see the incredible diversity that God has gathered together in that place where we live. So that got me to thinking about our church's neighborhood, about the neighborhood centered right here at the corner of Bel Air and Newcastle. Now, I I know just about everybody who goes to our church, and I know a, a good segment of the people who live nearby. You probably do too. And so we've got assumptions about who lives in our neighborhood. We've got assumptions about the kind of people who live nearby. And so I was wondering, do my assumptions match the reality? Do my assumptions match the real data? In other words, if we take a closer look at our neighborhood, what will we find that we just hadn't been thinking about? And who will we see that we haven't noticed yet? So here's what I did. 
I use this great demographic mapping tool called Mission Insight to investigate. I drew a three mile radius around our church. 4417 Bel Air Boulevard is at the center of this circle. And inside this circle is what we sometimes call our mission field. And the people who live inside this circle aren't more important than anyone else, but they are, as a friend of mine says, they are the people who live in the shadow of our church's steeple. These are the people God has placed closest to us. So we ought to care for them deeply. So what do we know about these people? Here's what I've discovered from my demographic research. This is the data. Some of it was surprising, some of it wasn't. In 2019, there were 209,700 people who lived inside this circle around our church. And of those 209,700 people, 27% of them are under age 18. More than a quarter of people who live nearby are under age 18. And 12% of the people who live inside that circle are over age 65. The largest group, 30% of the people who live in our neighborhood are ages 35 to 54. Now, uh, 25% of households with kids 25% of the households that have kids in them inside this circle are single parent households, a single mom or a single dad raising kids. I didn't know that. In terms of racial diversity, 47% of our neighbors are white, 30% are Hispanic Latino, 11% are Asian, 10% are black or African American, and 2% fall into this this catch-all category of Pacific Islanders and uh, and, um, American Indians. That wasn't surprising to me, but until I looked at the actual numbers, I didn't know that this circle represents what's sometimes referred to as a majority-minority community. And I didn't know this either. 43% of the people who live inside this circle, 43% of the people in our mission field speak a language other than or in addition to English at home. And the people who live in this circle, last fact here, the people who live in this circle have a median family income that is significantly greater than the statewide average. Now at the same time though, and this is interesting, at the same time the number of families living in poverty is about the same as the state average, 12%. The point is, without going anywhere, Staying right where we are, we are in the middle of an incredibly diverse community, just like Paul was everywhere he went on his missionary journeys. We have different categories than Jew and Greek, but the reality is the same. In our mission field here in Bel Air and in the very place you live, there are significant cultural differences from house to house from apartment to apartment, from block to block, from neighborhood to neighborhood. People eat different kinds of food. They speak different languages. Their families are organized differently. They come from different backgrounds. They have different interpretations of the past and different hopes for the future. And God has put us here, in this place, in the middle of that diversity. God has put you where you are with a mission. For the same reason that God sent Paul on his journey to proclaim the good news about Jesus. So I want to give you an assignment today. An assignment that I think will help us all on our staycation. An assignment that I hope will help you proclaim the good news about Jesus right where you live. I'm going to do this every week, give you a a short assignment during this series. And, And what I want you to do today is this. I want you to think about your story the story of your life. And I want you to think about Jesus' story, the story of Jesus' life. And then I want you to put them together. There are a lot of ways you can do that, uh, but here's one to get you started. Scripture talks about about Jesus as the light of the world as light shining in the darkness. So I I want you to think about a bright moment from your life, something good, something great, a bright spot, a light moment in your life. Then ask yourself this question. What did Jesus have to do with that moment? How was God, how was Jesus involved in that moment? I know he was because he is the light of the world. All good things come from him. 
So that good moment in your life, what did Jesus have to do with that? That's your assignment. Think through that question. Answer that question. Because you see, the first step in proclaiming the good news about Jesus is knowing how Jesus has been good to you. And this is important. Hear me when I say, you don't need to convince anyone that Jesus is good. That's just true. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to convince and convict and change people's hearts. Your job is simply to tell people how you've seen God's goodness in your life. Learn to put your story and Jesus' story together. And I'm going to end on this. There are a lot of people in our world who are afraid right now. There are a lot of people in your neighborhood, in our neighborhood, around the church, who are afraid right now. They're afraid because of all the current events happening that we know so well, and they're afraid because there's an election this fall. And when the election is over, half the country is going to be bitterly disappointed. The other half will be happy, but maybe for the wrong reasons. Now, the church always matters but we matter more than ever right now. Because no matter what happens in November, we will be here at the corner of Bel Air and Newcastle as a sign that there is a God and that there are people who are committed to God's mission in this place. That's what everybody who lives in the shadow of this steeple needs to know, that there is a God and that there are people who are committed to holy things like reconciliation and mercy, like justice and forgiveness, like truth and peacemaking, light in the darkness. I've said it three times now because what I want you to hear more than anything this morning is the good news about Jesus. That Jesus came into the world not to condemn you but to save you. That Jesus came into the world not just to judge your sins but to forgive your sins so that you can be made whole, so that you can have a flourishing relationship with God and with others, and so that God can work through you to make the world we live in today much more like the world God intends for it to be. Let's pray. Good and faithful God, here we are, ready to serve you. You've poured out your grace into our lives, showing us the goodness and the light of Christ. Help us now to be bearers of that good news. To be bearers of that good news each day in every word and action, showing the neighbors around us your light and your love. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it's been a joy to worship God together this morning. I'm so glad that you were here. Make sure to fill out a Connect card to send your prayer requests in. I pray for you each week, and, and our prayer team prays for the concerns you send in each week. Uh, you can find that Connect card at belairumc.org slash stay connected. And that's where you'll also find resources for this week to stay connected with God, to, to stay connected with others, and to stay connected with service. I'll also put our staycation assignments there so that you can find them easily after worship. Also, make sure you're signed up for emails uh, that we send out each week. That's a primary way we're communicating. Uh, and so that's the best way to know, best way to stay in the know and up to date with what's happening here at Bel Air United Methodist Church. Thanks again for being here this morning. I look forward to seeing you soon.